All right, welcome back to the Neuromatch Conference. Uh, I am pleased that you're here and excited for this next talk. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Manish Sahani. Many of you know Manish, but um, for those of you that don't, he is a professor of theoretical neuroscience and machine learning at the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit of the University of College London. Um, I'm excited for his talk today, Chasing the Light, Mechanistically Informed Statistical Models of Dynamics. Manish, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks very much, Chris. And, and let me thank uh, all the people who've put a lot of effort uh, into getting this meeting together. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to meet people virtually, if not in person, but in, in these <clears throat> straightened times, we, we take what we uh, are given. Uh, and I think it's really marvelous to have these opportunities. I'd like to start by um, thinking about the role of models and the types of models that we encounter in neuroscience. Uh, and this is actually something that when you are around theoreticians and modelers, you'll, you'll hear a lot about because uh, I think there's a lot of different roles that models play and lots of different types of models. Uh, and, and understanding how they interact becomes very important. One of the reasons that we have all these sorts of different models uh, is that we're seeking to describe the system at all sorts of different scales, uh, all the way from the components of a cell, perhaps even molecules, uh, to the behavior of the whole organism. Um, and when we start to build models, um, we can build sort of models across perhaps the, the best models will link a few scales together. Uh, and often these have the flavor uh, of what you might think of as a classic scientific model. Um, they're reductionist in some sense. They explain what's going on at one of these layers in terms of what we might know about the structure as a layer below. And I'm gonna call these mechanistic models. Uh, but because the system that we're looking at is an evolved one, it's been selected over millennia of evolution, we can also ask a different kind, look for a different kind of explanatory model, um, which says how is it that the, or why is it rather, that the particular arrangement that we might see here has been selected amongst all the other possibilities that, that might have been around, right? And these are really questions about what function does, does this particular structure somewhere in our, our scale hierarchy serve for the organism as a whole? And so often we think of these as coming top down or that I've called them normative here. We might think of them as computational models. Now these are explanatory models, but of course there's also a class of models in neuroscience and in, indeed all sciences, which are more descriptive. And I'm gonna call these phenomenological. Um, they seek to capture in a mathematical mathematically concise way, uh, as far as possible, uh, the function or the, uh, the behavior that we observe. And again, at all of these different scales of, of explanation. Okay, so uh, these I think become very important and they become important particularly when we're dealing with a system of the complexity and the sort of multi-scale nature of things like the brain. And that's because they're essential first of all, to test the explanatory structures that we come up with. If, I, if I've made some predictions about what should happen at this population level um, on the basis of it, the uh, properties of individual neurons and the connections between them, um, I need to have measurements at the population level and I need to be able to work out since I won't know the properties of the specific neurons that I happen to have recorded from embedded in my network and indeed all the other neurons that I haven't recorded from that are affecting that activity. I have to find a way to characterize the population activity in order to, uh, that will make sense to relate to the prediction that the mechanistic model makes. And exactly the same thing is true at the normative level. The normative scale won't tell us things about specific neurons within the system. They'll tell us something about um, uh, typical structures or circuits that we might expect to see. Uh, and in order to test these, we need to capture in some sort of phenomenological description what we actually see in the data. Okay, so they can test, but of course we often look at phenomena for which we do not have an explanation. We don't have either a mechanistic or a normative account of them. Uh, and so in these cases, um, the phenomenology will inform hypotheses. They'll tell us what the targets are and they'll allow us to work out um, what needs to be emphasized in a mechanistic scheme or indeed, uh, tell us something about what sorts of computation 
might be going on or give us guesses as to, uh, to um, the sort of underlying computational structure that the circuit implements. So my group has uh, actually, you know, first uh, mention uh, at the population scale, which I'm going to focus on here in the middle of the scale um, sequence. Um, we, of course, have models of all of these sorts. Uh, I'm not going to dwell very much on the normative ones today. Um, but I will think a little bit about mechanistic models. And, and here, you know, there, there are many such. Um, you know, some of them think about the, the activity um, that emerges from networks that consist of excitatory in red here and inhibitory in blue cells. Um, and a good example of this, for example, was the, uh, the mean field work uh, of Hugh Wilson and Jack Cowan. Um, a more recent example might be that of Van Fajrik and Sompolinsky. Um, uh, the models, modeling that can be done at the, this mechanistic level uh, may be biophysically detailed. It might be a very de a, a large scale simulation uh, with much biophysical realism, or there might be an attempt to abstract, in, in, uh, for example, by mean field methods, away some, some sort of central um, statistical structure uh, that emerges from perhaps random connectivity in this network. Um, but in either case, the idea is to take this anatom anatomical observations about the circuit and see what sorts of constraints those might Im impose on activity. The phenomenological approach at this population scale tends to look at uh, uh, spike trains or, or similar, um, ideally single neuron uh, recordings, perhaps calcium trains, uh, calcium signals or something like that. Um, across a population of cells that are, are working together uh, in, a, in a recurrent circuit um, and try to, tries to achieve a similar low level or, or low dimensional uh, description of what's going on. And indeed, in some cases, in exactly the same sort of dynamical portrait sense um, that is a, uh, achieved in these um, uh, mechanistic mean field uh, uh, styles and indeed, uh, this, this particular picture uh, comes from a recent paper uh, from the group uh, 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 that appeared at Dicey Bell last year. Um, so these are those statistical models, right? They're, they're being shaped by recorded data, things like spike trains. Um, and they use those data to reveal the coordinated activity in population recordings um, in vivo, um, and that are underlying some sort of computation. And the hope is that by either describing trajectories of in, in some low dimensional sense or dynamical portraits like this, we can get a handle on what kind of computation is being done. So as I said, my group has been uh, involved in this for quite a while. This is an extremely selective list of references of, of different methods, uh, selective in the sense that it, it I, a, a list of things that, that we've worked on here. Uh, but of course, this, this is embedded within a space of, of many people in the field uh, who've been working on related and, and indeed quite different models uh, that try to, to live in the same space. I'm not going to step through all of these in any detail, uh, but I do want to sort of separate out um, sort of two classes in a sense. Models that look for um, the underlying um, so sort of population structure just by driven by effectively variance, directions that capture as much of the uh, data in the population as possible. Um, one of these introduced in this paper in 2009, we called Gaussian process factor analysis, uh, but really there are a lot of variants at the simplest level. And in fact, we'll see some today. One could just be doing principal components analysis on the population data, just exactly the directions in the space that capture the most variance. Um, other variant, other versions of this might um, try to fit point process uh, models for the individual data. That's true of uh, this recent paper. Um, uh, might take into account jitter in time between trials um, or, or might try to capture variants under certain other statistical constraints. Uh, but these are all capturing variants. There's another class of models that is seeking to actually identify a dynamical structure in the data um, people sometimes call these state-space models. We often call them linear dynam or dynamical system models, linear or perhaps non-linear. Um, and uh, in this case, 
the idea is that the the those dynamics are telling us something about the computational rules um, that underlie the way the circuit evolves. Uh, and it, perhaps it's worth highlighting this paper about to appear in, in Europe's um, um, by Virginia Rutten, um, uh, which um, actually uses GPFA-like approaches, so variance capturing approaches, to try to say something about um, a, dynamic, a more dynamical view of those data. So there's you know, ways to trade off between these. Okay. Um, so these are uh, models that are trying to find common structure or dynamical portraits, but they're doing so in from the data alone. And I think the question for today in a sense is, are there ways that we can take them, uh, take the mechanistic and computational constraints and use them to inform uh, the pictures that we get from the data while actually gaining ideally, um, there's a risk that we might lose it, but, but gain interpretability in the process. Okay, so that's what we're gonna dwell on. How do we take in particular, in this case, mechanistic constraints and use them to inform the sorts of uh, uh, dynamical portraits that we might uh, try to build from data sets. And so I'm gonna tell you now about a particular approach uh, to doing this that uh, we've taken recently. Um, and we were led to this by looking at a particular data set uh, and, and a puzzle within that data set and trying to understand where the phenomenon that we were observing came from. Uh, and so I'm gonna start by actually making sure that I acknowledge all of the people involved and, and tell you where these data have come from. Uh, so you'll see the slide again at the end, but, but uh, I wanted to put it here too. So the data we're looking at uh, are going, uh, were collected by Dan O'Shea and Wera Kongu when they were graduate students at Stanford in Krishna Shinoi's lab. Um, and then more recently, uh, Leah Dunker, who's a graduate student with me, about to graduate in fact, uh, and Dan, who went on to become a postdoc uh, at Stanford, have been looking, have, um, analyzing the data, um, fitting the sorts of models that I'm going to describe here, and indeed trying to understand at a somewhat deeper theoretical level what's going on. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into the theory today. I'm going to focus more on the, on the, the um, statistical modeling part of this work. Um, uh, but, but, but really, I think this, there's, a, there's a story that is connecting um, things that we know about the, uh, the anatomy uh, to the data that I'm about to show you. And all of this is part of uh, a very long-standing collaboration between my group and Krishna Shinoi is a very rewarding uh, uh, collaboration over the years. Okay, so the experiment that um, Dan and Warapong were, were doing uh, involved uh, animals doing, um, a, at this point, quite very standard um, delayed reaching tasks. So uh, these are rhesus macaques that have been trained uh, to touch a central point on a screen and then later move to touch a point, um, uh, in this case, located on a ring around that original central point. Um, but there's a, um, they've been trained to withhold the movement when the target that they're about to touch first appears, wait for a while until the central point extinguishes, at which point they know to initiate the movement. So this introduces a delay between target onset and what we'll call the go queue. Um, and there's also, of course, uh, a, a little bit of a reaction time delay um, between when that go queue is actually delivered on the screen or, or when the point is removed from the screen uh, and when they move their arm. Okay, in this particular experiment, uh, Dan and Werapong had injected into the motor cortex uh, of, of two rhesus macaques, um, a viral construct that expressed an excitatory uh, uh, opsin uh, in uh, pyramidal cells in the area. So this was the construct. Um, they had a number of injection sites, uh, quite broadly in one of the monkeys and a more narrow region in the others. Uh, that's the kind of green circles here. And then they were able to stimulate using a fiber and record in a region around that fiber um, uh, as, as they stimulated. Uh, and the stimulation, the laser delivery, um, could occur either during this delay period, which we'll refer to as delay early, around the time that the go queue was delivered, there we go, or around the time that the movement was, or, or during the movement, which we'll call peri-move. 
Okay, now um, the first thing to check is there, uh, that the you know, experiment worked, the virus expressed, and the channel reduction or the uh, opsin worked, it did C1V1. Um, and indeed it did. So if they, uh, as I said, they were recording at the same time as stimulating, and as, uh, some of the recordings were done right uh, next to the fiber uh, with a, a, a kind of complex uh, optrode, uh, and some of them were some distance away. And you can see that this is the difference in firing with, by stimulation or not as a function of distance. And so you can see that there are really appreciable changes in firing all the way out to at least two millimeters from the fiber. Uh, and there are some neurons that have sustained changes in firing uh, all the way out to, um, oops, uh, all the way out to four millimeters. Um, and so there really is a, a, a very substantial impact of the, uh, of the light in this area. And I'm emphasizing that because the first part of the puzzle, not the part that we're really going to dwell on today, was that despite this fact, there was very little effect on the ongoing behavior. So neurons changed their firing, but there was no movement evoked when the laser turned on, for example, in this period when the animal was holding its arm still. Um, there was no effect on the trajectory or, or speed or anything else of the, of the movement so no effect on the kinematics and movement. There was a small delay in the initiation of the movement when the light was delivered around the time of the goku, um, but it's much shorter at about 10 milliseconds than the duration of the, of the laser, laser pulse itself, which was 200 milliseconds. But as I said, that's not what we're really going to be focusing on, at least directly. We're gonna be looking at the neural data. Uh, and, and looking at another puzzle that comes out of that. Um, and that's the following. So here what I've drawn is the um, a time series of activity uh, of the population of neurons that were recorded. Um, and I've drawn them in uh, projected onto three dimensions, which capture the most variance, the principal component dimensions. Okay, so this is the leading principal component of the, ver so it's the direction that captures the most variance across different uh, targets for the reach, so different conditions, uh, and across time. Um, and so each one of these traces is a, uh, the projected set of all the neuronal PSTHs into that first principal component. Uh, and the color tells you what the reaching, what the target of the reach was. So there's four different reach targets here. This is in PC1, PC2, and PC3. And here are the timing of the events, the go queue and movement onset. Okay, so, so these are the sorts of uh, population trajectories that we often see when uh, recorded motor cortex. Uh, now let's ask what happens in the trials, and sorry, I didn't emphasize this. These are trials where there was no optogenetic stimulation. This, this is just the baseline activity. What happens when there is stimulation? So again, here are the three phases when stimulation might be delivered um, relative uh, to the GoQ and movement onset. Uh, and we're going to first look at this first principal component. Before the stimulation is presented, things look much the same, that's reassuring. Um, at the time that the, the, the laser's turned on, there's a very large perturbation. Now you already saw on the large, last slide that neurons change their firing quite a lot. But what you didn't know is that that change in firing is at least partly aligned with the same direction as carries variants during the trial when it's not perturbed which is what uh, it's a, the unperturbed trials that defined that principal component one. So there is a big perturbation in this principal component direction. Um, during the stimulus, uh, or while, while the laser's on, um, the perturbation is sustained, maybe decays a little bit. We'll see that again uh, shortly. But um, the underlying sort of dynamical process of the trial had it not been perturbed, so this deflection here and this return here, also do seem to be preserved underneath that, uh, that uh, stimulus perturbation. Once the laser turns off, the uh, uh, activity returns extremely rapidly. This is one time step at the moment uh, towards the point at which it would have been had the, uh, in an unperturbed trial. And indeed it returns and follows exactly the same dynamical pattern to within noise uh, as it would have had there been no optogenetic perturbation at all. And that's true across the principal components. Okay, so the stimulation 
um, has an effect, as we saw. It has an effect which uh, not only on the neurons as a whole, but also in the subspace that it has activity related to the task, which is what's defined by the principal components here. Um, nonetheless, once the laser turns off, that activity recovers very rapidly, and there's little or no effect on the trajectory here, the neuronal trajectory that's followed subsequently. And so I said, we're not gonna really focus on the behavioral effect, but you can see that there's a potential relationship between what we see neurally and what was observed behaviorally. Okay, so what's going on? Um, so, and, and why do I say that this is a puzzle? Well, um, let's take a state space view of what's going on. Right. So here is a high dimensional space, which we think of the neuronal activity as, as filling. Um, each dimension of the space is one neuron, uh, and there's a very large number of these things. But we find in these data, and in many similar data sets, that much of the uh, activity of the, of the neurons ends up being confined to a relatively lower dimensional space, um, something on the order of 10 to 20. Uh, and we can think of this as a low dimensional task activity space. Okay, so what we observed was that um, there was little impact of the light on behavior. And perhaps one explanation for that was that everything that was interesting about the activity happened to be in this low dimensional space that was orthogonal to the direction of stimulation. So for whatever reason, when you you know, uh, infect pyramidal cells and shine a laser specifically to excite them, uh, that sort of common mode of activation perhaps is not a mode uh, which uh, is explored when the task is actually, when the system is actually carrying out a computation. It's orthogonal to the computation. But that's not true, right? We saw that in fact, there was a projection of the stimulation into this space. Uh, much of the firing rate changes are outside that space, but this projection is actually large. It's larger than would be expected if this was just a random direction relative to the underlying dynamical subspace. Okay. Um, all right. So the answer is no. Uh, what's going on is not simply that the stimulation is orthogonal to the task activity. Um, we saw that it does perturb them. Uh, we saw that the activity recovers rapidly. This is a puzzle because the dynamics uh, the, by which the system evolves within the subspace are relatively slow. Uh, and so if you perturb something that has a long time constant, you should see its effects for a long time, right? And indeed, if we go ahead and fit a dynamical system model, which we can to describe the, the evolution of the data in this space uh, fairly accurately, um, we find that uh, if we then perturb that system, exactly as expected, the perturbation lasts for a long time. We don't get a return to the uh, trajectory that we would have had otherwise. So that's the puzzle. What's going on? Okay, we have a robustness in dynamics. Um, uh, this may be because the dynamics actually aren't created by this population we're recording from. They're just inheriting it from somewhere else. Um, that's possible. Um, but it turns out, and this is something that Leia noticed a little while ago, um, that it was possible, although if we just train a linear dynamical system to capture the unstimulated activity alone, and then ask what happens when we perturb it, it's not robust, but that perturbation lasts for a long time. It is possible to train a linear dynamical system explicitly to be robust to the stimulation. So we have to add some trials with stimulated activity for this to happen, um, but we can do that. And we get a, a, a linear dynamical system that basically behaves in the way that our, da that our data do. Um, but that's not very satisfactory. We can do it, but um, we basically have to, to peek at the stimulated data to, to understand what's going on. It doesn't provide us with any explanatory power. Um, Okay, but we can still ask what's going on in that network. And it turns out that uh, sort of the key point, and it's fairly easy to see this, we'll, we'll see it on the next slide, depends on an underlying non-normality in the dynamics. What do I mean by that? Well, um, here again is the picture that we had before. Um, 
our, our hypothetical picture, task activity space, and in an ideal world, the stimulation might have been orthogonal to that. Um, what we actually observed was that stimulation, the stimulation input doesn't perturb the dynamics, right? And so this orthogonality relationship need not be with the space in which the task related activity lies, but it should be within the space which drives the dynamical evolution of the network. Um, but that space that drives the dynamical evolution of the network need not be the same as that where the network produces activity. Okay. Um, now, it often is that these are true that these two things are the same, but then they need not be if the dynamical system um, that gives rise to the activity that we're looking at has this property of non-normality. That is, the, the, the weight matrix that takes one state to the next is a non-normal matrix. Okay. So our next question is, well, okay, we can do it. We need non-normality. Is that sort of geometric picture I've drawn here or the, or the appearance of non-normality just a coincidence? Well, non-normality is interesting in a mechanistic sense because networks that are um, composed of cells that are either excitatory or inhibitory, so networks that satisfy Dale's law, are always non-normal. Uh, and that's easy to see if this is the weight matrix of such a network, um, the red dots correspond to excitatory connections, the blue dots to inhibitory connections. And you can see that if I multiply this by a vector of neuronal, activi of, of neuronal activities, each one will either be um, multiplied by entirely red values or by entirely blue values. Okay, so that means that this satisfies Dale's law. If I take w, this weight matrix W and multiply it by its transpose on the right, uh, if you just sort of line everything up, you'll see that every entry in their product has to be positive. The positive uh, weights multiply with positive ones, negative with negative ones. But if I take the left product, W transpose W, now positive times positive, but here we get positive times negative. And so I get these off diagonal blocks of a different sign. Normality requires that these two matrices commute. That is these two products are equal and they can't be, right? So um, uh, Dale's law networks are always non-normal. Could it be that what we're looking at has something to do with this underlying structure? And so now to answer that question, we had to have a way to create a model that satisfies Dale's law and still reproduces many features of the recorded data. And what does that look like? So here's the structure, here's the, uh, the model that uh, Leia and Dan developed. So we're gonna start with a description at, the, at something like a network level. Uh, we will have a um, high dimensional state. This is about a thousand neurons in the models that uh, Leia and Dan are actually fitting, um, which we're gonna call new. Um, and um, the uh, new is, you know, is a vector representing the activity of a lot of different cells. Um, the mapping into, in time is still linear with the weight matrix W, and that weight matrix has positive and negative entries in accordance with Dale's law. Uh, it's also sparse so that many cells, cells make only a, a limited number of connections to other cells in the network. Uh, we also enforce um, balance in that network, so the net Ex, uh, excitation plus inhibition coming into a given um, uh, neuron will always cancel. And mathematically, we can express that as saying that if we multiply uh, the vector of all ones by W, we just get zero out. Okay, we want to take that model and use and fit, use it uh, to, to describe recorded PSTHs without stimulation. Um, and so we're going to do that linearly, but we're going to uh, depend on an observation that the when we actually look at these PSTHs and ask what the, how the variance is concentrated is low dimensional and indeed in that low dimensional space the dynamics that seem to underlie their evolution is self-contained uh, and so to enforce those two constraints we require that the mapping from new to y be low rank it's a product of two matrices um, where the matrix j just up through here is a matrix which will map the high dimensional activity into a low dimensional space. Uh, and then C will take that low dimensional activity and map it back out to the recorded neurons. Okay. Now J is a, a matrix that we just choose randomly and fix. 
but C is a matrix which then needs to be optimized to fit the data. Uh, the other thing we need to do is ensure that these dynamics are self-contained. And I'll just very quickly, actually, I probably won't take us through this in any detail, um, but there's a constraint that we will impose on uh, the interaction between W and J, which essentially makes sure, that's what these equations I'm skipping uh, uh, say, it makes sure that activity um, that lives outside of this subspace um, effectively remains outside of the subspace. It doesn't influence anything that, that goes on within it. And that's necessary to account for this observation that we make routinely, that when we fit models to um, these sorts of data, we actually find a low dimensional projection, which is self-contained in its dynamics. Okay, so that's the model. Uh, so we have a way of taking excited, uh, a, 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 an EI balanced network, um, requiring that it reproduce the data that were uh, um, observed. We could, so we're gonna fit the matrix W and fit the matrix C, such that that is true. But we will satisfy the constraints of balance and that the, in this low dimensional space, which was chosen randomly, um, the dynamics, uh, it's the projection into that space that must reconstruct the data, that's what we say here, and the dynamics must appear self-contained both observations that, that appear to be true of many data sets, not just this one. Okay. All right, so does it work? So we can fit the model and it does indeed manage to describe the, um, the activity of the um, recorded populations um, essentially as well as an unconstrained LDS would. So here are the model, so initializing the model and just running forward under the influence of W uh, I didn't stress this on the last slide. Um, there's uh, uh, the model, of course, can't know at the time of the go queue, and so the, uh, there is an input that uh, perturbs the system to initiate the movement-related activity that comes in at the time that corresponds to the time that the go queue was delivered, and that was called U on the last slide. Uh, so there's basically um, uh, one input in this regime and a different input in this regime, which is why you get that perturbation. Okay. Um, if you just fit a, a linear dynamical system to these data without any of the constraints, as I said, it's slow. And you can see that slowness if we look at the eigenvalues of the matrix that's learned, uh, they all cluster right up here, uh, close to the uh, unit circle uh, and actually close to a real part of, of, um, uh, of one. Um, in this case, we have a much larger system, right? Um, uh, uh, a thousand of these, so a thousand eigenvalues, most of them look like a random network, just a, a uniform disk um, with some gap to one. Um, the ones marked in blue are the ones that are responsible for dynamics in this subspace J, and that's where the slow stuff gets constrained, okay? But there's also some, some faster decay modes in there. Uh, and this is the amount of variance that's captured. Um, uh, yeah, so, here the constrained network, here the unconstrained network. And you can see that there's a small loss in the constraint. This is a, a more constrained model than this one, but it's, it's quite small. Okay, so what now happens when we look at the way this network responds to perturbation? So we fit the data. What happens if we now stimulate this network, introduce a new perturbation S? And the perturbation we're going to choose is random strengths of perturbation on just the E cells. And the variability comes from in the model or is meant to simulate the fact that there's noise in the opposite expression. Okay, um, so this is the measured in the data um, difference between unperturbed activity and perturbed activity. And this is the, the length of that vector difference. And so you can see that it moves rapidly up. Uh, it actually decays a little bit, which is probably because of um, the, the uh, photocurrent itself actually decaying. That's not something we're going to model. But then when the laser turns off down here, it returns very quickly down to um, something close to baseline. But then there's actually this long decay, which we didn't see in the PCA data as clearly. Um, if we now look at the perturbation of the network, apart from that decay, that, as I said, we're not modeling, um, the rest of the structure looks much the same. Rapid up, uh, upswing, um, it stays high for quite a while, rapidly comes off most of the way when you turn off the light, um, but then decays away relatively slowly. 
Um, now, what does this look like if we now look in the principal component space? Uh, and again, we're going to define the principal components just like was done here in the data by the dimensions that carry unstimulated variants. Uh, and the answer is that again, we do see a perturbation that appears within that space. And the net effect is actually on a similar scale uh, to what we have here, uh, although in the data in this particular run, well, sorry, the data, this was all concentrated uh, in the first principal component, much more so than in, in later ones. Whereas in this particular run of the model, it was more distributed across the top three, but that actually varies from, from instance to instance. Um, so qualitatively, we see the same phenomenon, a rapid perturbation, much less sign of that slow decay that we had before, uh, that, we, that we had on the previous slide here, right, this, this thing over here. Um, uh, and, a, and really a picture that looks uh, at least qualitatively quite data-like. Uh, that can be made quantitative if we actually take a subset of the model neurons and ask, can we now use that model that subset without perturbing the dynamics at all and without fitting to stimulus to the to the stimulation vector um, to account for um, the measured neuronal data here again are the measurements uh, and here is the now model fit where we've added an extra fitting step from a random subset of the network uh, to actually try to predict the measured neurons uh, as opposed to just look at the top principal components of the network itself and that again is is holds up across the different conditions. Okay, so that's basically all what I wanted to show. So we, we had a way of, of fitting this model. Uh, and indeed, it turns out that the hypothesis that just this one extra constraint to the LDS, which is that it has to satisfy Dale's law and, and express the dynamics in completely in low dimensional space, appears to be sufficient to account for what otherwise look like a puzzle in the data. And as I said, there's a lot of theoretical work that Leia and Dan have been doing to try to, to connect those dots and ask, well, why is it uh, in a mathematical sense? But here we have the sort of phenomenological observation that it is. All right, so let me just uh, summarize to end. Um, so we saw that in these data, um, turning on the laser perturbs the responses, but once the laser turns off, uh, the responses reset very rapidly, they go back to to um, the activity they would have had otherwise. Um, we hypothesized that this might have something to do with the interaction of, uh, of excitatory inhibitory cells and therefore developed a way to fit a model while still a bit, uh, satisfying both phenomenological constraints, the observation of low dimensions, as well as the anatomical constraints of the EI network imbalance. Um, and indeed, we found that the non-normality introduced by that network naturally led to the sort of robustness that we were seeing in the data. Uh, and so some, you know, indeed, this is a situation where the mechanistic constraints are shaping functional dynamics in a way that turns out to be important to this data set. Uh, another thing to note is that the directions of maximum variance in the data over here are not necessarily the ones that are responsible for, in this case, the dynamical computation that's going on in the system. These two may not, they won't be orthogonal, but they may not be fully aligned. Um, and indeed, the, the low dimensionality of the space is important. Uh, and it may be that this robustness is part of the reason that we see that sort of low dimensionality. Uh, but that, again, is a speculation for another day. Let me thank uh, Leia, Dan, Whereupon, and Krishna again. And hopefully we have a little bit of time for some questions at the end. Thank you, Manish. Unfortunately, in this format, you are subjected just to the slow solo clap uh, <laughs> of me, but uh, there's been a robust discussion in the chat. And so I think people are, are, uh, are really engaged and, and excited about what you're showing. Thank you for that. Um, I wanna start with, well, if people may be typing some questions in the Q&A, um, there's a question that came up in the chat, and Dan has been chiming in there too, but I want to give you a chance to kind of answer in the video feed here. Um, I also think that I lost a little bit what the meaning of self-contained dynamics was. You know, that was okay. the other condition that you put on along with Dale's yep. law. So do you think that you could kind of say a little bit more about what that condition is? And yeah, what so, um, so there's two, 
two parts to it, right? So the first part is um, the observation. And the observation, uh, you know, the database observation is you have a population of neurons. Mm -hmm. You record, sorry, I keep looking at you over there because that's where you are on my screen, but the camera's here. Um, the, uh, you have a population of neurons. You look at the, a low dimensional projection of these and that low dimensional state, you can write a dynamical system on that low dimensional state that correctly predicts how it's going to evolve in the future. So you really have captured the state space. And in that sense, the dynamics are self-contained in the data. Uh, and this is an observation that, that you know, we and, and many others have made about motor cortical data in particular for, for quite a while now. Um, then the question is, okay, what do we mean in the model? Uh, and so in the model, that's um, what is going on here and what I found I didn't quite have the time to step through in detail, but maybe let's try to go through it. Um, so uh, here, if we think about the evolution of the high dimensional state, so that's this thing over here, mm -hmm. um, but we're asking how, let's look at the, um, that high dimensional state projected into uh, this low dimensional space. So that's just J times new. Well, J times new at time T plus one, new T plus one is just W times new at T, fair enough. But now we're gonna take this new at T and break it into two. So there's this part here and this part here, and the sum of those two terms, you know, this and this, oops, um, is just new of t. But what we've done is we've broken it into two parts, one of which lives in the space defined by j, and one of which is orthogonal to it. So that's your task. Now we're just going to say that orthogonal part should go to zero. And that's what this constraint is up here. And is that your task relevant and task irrelevant dimension or that's representing something well, else? Well, so in this case, uh, so the, what J is doing is it's, our constraint is that the activity within J should reconstruct the data. And this constraint says, just knowing the activity within J, uh, which is actually defined by this variable X, that's J times new, I should be able to predict how activity in J will evolve in the future. So that's what we mean by self-contained. I don't need any information about the orthogonal part of this in order to work out how things are going to evolve in here. And again, that, that's what we see in, in the recorded data. And that's why it makes sense to ask our model to reproduce it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. And you didn't need any nonlinearity in the network and the, the new variables in order to no, yeah. so so th so it's it's still actually a linear model entirely, right? Linear here and linear here, and so I, I mean it's worth pointing out that um, you know we sh we should really be thinking of these not as firing rates but as perturbations of firing rates away from a baseline, right. uh, and that also um, you know if if we really allow these to go negative as firing rates, then of course a positive weight suddenly switches to being negative, which would make no sense. So we really have to think about this as as perturbations away in some steady state. Yeah, great. All right, I think that is about the end of our time. Thank you so much, Manish, for the wonderful talk. Um, thank you all for joining us here today and for the robust discussion in the chat. Um, look forward to having this posted online so many other people can enjoy it who couldn't be here today. Manish, I know it's in the evening there. Thanks so much for giving up part of your evening um, for us here. Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks to everyone for, for listening. Take care, bye-bye.